We'll be recording this for other people to see later. Um, so my name is Nicole Ritchie. Um, I am a one of the coaches for the GRP rowing program at Craftsbury. Um, and I grew up in Putney, Vermont, um, and learned to row and ski in high school. So Akio, you want to introduce yourself too? Akio may be a yeah. little bit. Um, can I come across okay? Yeah, I, uh, I'm Akio. I am one of the athletes. On GRP, the Racing Project Crash Ray. I'm one of the skiers. This is the start of my third year of Crash Ray. Um, I, yeah, I don't have any formal training in any subjects, but like many people have been doing a lot of reading recently and, and uh, been trying to discuss with the call and collect some of these thoughts and things that come across into um, some of a more cohesive narrative and want to share that with, with all of you, with others. Um, yeah, Aki, and, I think your internet is getting a little please. tough there. Um, but Aki is a skier with the Green Racing Project um, and he so he and I together are making this presentation. Um, a little more about me is that I, through um, coaching after rowing in college, I coached a little bit collegiately. Um, and while I did that, I, I coached at uh, Temple University with the women's rowing team there. And while I did that, um, I was lucky to get a master's in urban education. And while I was Getting that master's, I focused especially on um, like racism in sports, as that was uh, an interest of, of mine, and especially um, in the history of rowing. Um, so that's kind of where I get, uh, we got some of this information from, um, but I, I definitely don't see myself as an expert in the field um, and have a lot to learn. So we're putting this presentation together um, to uh, kind of make it a conversation starter for the athletes at um, Crassberry and also the greater rowing and skiing community. Um, so I think Akio might be, it might be easier to hear him uh, without his video on. Um, and I will start screen sharing um if you have any questions please like jump in during the presentation and uh ask them you can uh direct them to akio um through the chat and then we'll try to uh target them as we go through the presentation so let's see let me make sure i'm gonna start screen sharing here Okay, Akio, can we hear you now? Uh, um, let me know, okay. Um, you're still breaking up a little, which is funny because it was working very well just a minute ago. Uh, um, I could try also. Yeah. I'll see if I can improve my situation. Okay. Well, I'll I'll start, um, and then we'll we'll see when we can hear Akio again, which I'm sure will 
he is working on. Um, so uh, the title of our presentation, we're looking at sport and race, and we decided to do this presentation as the Mythbusters edition. Um, so what are our, our objectives and why did we choose Mythbusters? Um, so we, these two, this picture here, these are uh, the Mythbusters themselves. Um, we chose Mythbusters um, because we wanted to look closely at uh, sports language in particular and to question that. Um, so why focus on language in sports? Um, I used to really not think about the language I used very much or not think it was a, a big deal to focus on. Um, and the more I've learned, the more um, important uh, we found it to be. Um, so throughout history, why, why focus on language? Because throughout history, language has been used to other and oppressed black people. This language comes from colonial perceptions of other cultures and creates historical myths that legitimize and promote current inequality. So when we place common sports language as myths, we can become myth busters within our sport and we can be critical and smart about how to make our sport better. So as we move to the next slide, uh, we just wanted to give an example of how Mythbusters worked. So um, here's a, a practice myth, number one. So, okay, so reptiles are the only animals that need to sunbathe. And we think about that as Mythbusters and we're like, okay, is that true? Can we find anything to change that? Um, and then here we go, this is my dog sunbathing in the yard when it was like 90 degrees back in the summer. Um, so we find evidence that we can then bust that myth. Um, so that's kind of how our uh, presentation will function and go forward. Um, and before we go uh, into the real myths that we want to talk about, we'll define some terms. Um, there's definitely a lot of different ways of defining these terms and this is just the way that we find um, productive and how we want to define them for this uh, presentation. So we define racism as a system of advantage based on race. And it's important that we think about um, racism as a system, um, as not just an individual thing. Uh, so the next term we'll come across is the racial wealth gap. Um, the racial wealth gap is consistent disparity in wages and generational wealth between the white and BIPOC population in America. Uh, and the next term is racial socialization. Um, this is one I, I really didn't come across until I started studying the topic more and uh, racial socialization is preparation for bias, so for racial bias. So how, how do we um, become biased? How do we how are we taught to become biased? Um, and then as we keep defining terms, I wonder if we can hear Akio now. He's in a better location perhaps. How am I coming across at the moment? Loud and clear. Sweet, okay. We'll see nice. if this continues as such. Yeah. Um, yeah, so anti-racist is a term that has been becoming more prevalent recently is a term coined by Ibram X. Kendi, professor in 2019. Um, he, he, had, he has a few books on the ideas, on racist ideas and the history of racist ideas in America. Anti-racist is a term that talks about, yeah, as you can see here, go ahead and read it. Someone who deliberately is confessing the racist ideas that have been nurtured within them while trying to be better, trying to be different, and trying to support policies that create equity. And one way or an allegory that we can use that might be helpful throughout this presentation, um, something we can keep in mind is an idea of looking at racism as a conveyor belt at the airport. So in this idea, we have 
actively racist behavior is like walking along the conveyor belt. You are going quickly toward the destination, a place of racism. Um, but there's also passive racism. And this is the sort that is maybe unintentional, but because we live in a racist society, um, as we said in our definition of racism, it's a system of advantage based on race. So that system is built into our society. And you could be passively racist by being on this conveyor belt. You are not actively trying to go to the destination, but you are still being carried to that same destination, a place of racism. In order to avoid that result of being in this place of racism, you have to first notice that you're on this conveyor belt. And you have to see that current that's pulling you toward this place of racism. And that would be considered anti-racist. And then some people use the term actively anti-racist. And that would be not only recognizing this current, but turning around and walking in the opposite direction at a speed faster than the conveyor belts so that you actually avoid ending up at the same place of racism. So this idea of seeing the current that is within society that leads to racist results, um, leads to systems that are racist, uh, being able to see that and acknowledge that and then try and react in the opposite direction are things we can think about as we kind of go through this presentation. Um, and it might be a helpful framework. Totally, totally. So um, I th we, that this idea of the conveyor belt, I, is just like Akio is saying is, um, you know, if, if we're looking for myths in the language of sports, um, that's one way that we can try to understand like where we're going on the conveyor belt and try to actively um, change that. So onto the next slide here. Um, so we'll look at myth number two. Um, this is something as kind of a, a phrase that I certainly heard a lot um, in sports growing up. Um, so the myth uh, would be color doesn't matter in sport and we compete on an equal playing field. So in looking at this language, we wanna, we wanna look for evidence um, that this may or may not uh, be true or how we can be critical of it. Um, so first of all, it's important to look at economic inequality in America um, as this limits who gets to the field. Uh, this chart here is from the Aspen Institute. They're um, a really inter interesting uh, institution that, that creates, uh, well, that basically tracks data on American sports. Um, this is from their, what they call the state of play from 2018. Um, and this chart is looking at physically inactive children. So this is the percentage of kids ages six to 12 who engaged in no sport activity during the year. Um, so we can see if, as we look from 2012 to 2018, there's a trend of a lower percentage um, going from 19% to 17%. So we're having less kids engaging in no sport activity. Um, so that's, that's very good for uh, um, children's health in America. Um, if we look closer at the chart though, we can see that income level is correlated with sports, uh, sports participation as well. So um, like if we look at, the, at 2012 um, for families that are making under 25,000, we can see that in 2012, 24.4% of the lowest income bracket, 24.4% um, of kids were um, engaging in no sport activity during the year. And then this has grown um, in 2000, you know, throughout between 2012 and 2018, it has grown to 33.4%. Um, in the lowest income bracket and in the highest income bracket of families making over 100,000, um, we can see the percentage of kids not engaging in sport activity decreasing. So going from 14.4% to 9.9%. Um, so that we can really see from this chart that 
um, less kids from lower income families are participating in sports and more kids in higher income families are participating in sports. Um, so this, as we go to our next slide here, um, continues uh, during a similar, during the same time period as we look at a study that focused on uh, first generation college athletes. Um, so uh, this is, we took um, this chart from another chart that actually I can pull up since we're on Zoom. Um, but basically this, this is looking at from 2010 to 2015, as the gap between the rich and the poor has grown in America, our first generation college athlete pool has decreased. So um, you can see the differences here with uh, men's D1 basketball. Uh, the blue is 2010 and the red is 2015. And you can see the percentage of first generation college athletes dropping from 2010 to 2015, both in women's D1 basketball and in men's D1 bas bas basketball. Um, and then we also added women's D1 rowing on here. Um, you can see there's not a huge percentage of first generation college athletes in women's rowing. Um, but between 2010 and 2015, this percentage dropped more than half. Um, and then one more that we wanted to put to add on here is, is looking at women's tennis, which is one of the few um, college athlete or college sports that has increased the level of first generation college athletes um, overall. So that's interesting because um, as we'll show later, uh, there have been certain sports that have kind of done more for recruitment and funding um, and tennis being one of them that we'll go further into um, later on in the presentation. And just to pull up in case folks are interested, um, I can share the graphic from, so this is from um, a really awesome uh, uh, online uh, website called The Undefeated. And this was from the NCAA goal study. So it's the same chart we're pulling the info from, but it's kind of nice since we're on Zoom, we can look at the graphics here. So this is 2010 percentage of first generation athletes by sport. And then as I click on 2015, you can see the changes per sport. Okay, so back to our presentation. Um, so one more thing, it is important as we're talking about disparities in sports participation for different income levels, it's important to talk about the racial wealth gap um, because economic issues can pile on top of each other as uh, pile on top of racial issues um, to create barriers to access to sports, um, which is why we wanted to pull up this graphic here. Um, and if Akio, you want to chime in on this. Yeah, so as we're saying, the um this racial wealth gap becomes very important. The distinction between class and race are very tied in this, in this regard. So we can look at this graph. It's um, pretty telling. So keying in on the legend for this graph, the top blue line here, this is the median wealth for white families in America. This is the 50th percentile, the middle family in America you can see the median wealth rising until 2007 and financial crash in 2008. We get this dip, but then you start climbing again. So in 2016, we're ending with $163,000 is the median white family wealth, familial wealth. So then we can look at the second piece in the key is the median wealth for black families. And this is the bottom yellow line. 
And we see that the trends are actually the same. It is still increasing from 89 through almost 2007, through the mid 2000s. Then we see a decrease and then a slight increase again coming from into the last few years of 2014, 15, 16. The purple line is, I think, a little bit um, confusing. At first you think, oh, maybe that's the median black um, family wealth, but that's the 75th percentile wealth for black families in the middle. So we see that the difference between the medians for white and black families is huge. It's about tenfold here. Um, and you also can see that black families lost approximately 50% of their wealth in the financial crisis in 2008. So what wealth they did have, and that was increasing, they lost about half of that, which is a large percentage and more than you saw in white families, the median white family. Um, the 70th percentile of black families are closer to the white families, familial wealth, um, but you can still they st see they still lag behind. So this is a pretty telling graph. Um, it really makes highlights how important the combination of class and race are in this country. Yeah, and so when we're looking at, um, you know, different um, economic uh, levels and, and the access that different families have in those separate levels to sports, um, it's really important to also reference this graph of the racial wealth gap that's been creative, be created because of historical barriers to access to wealth for black fam families. Um, so to move on to our next slide. Uh, so why, um, why are less lower income uh, children accessing sports? Why um, is it harder to participate in sports um, for low income families? Um, the consensus um, as I researched this really was um, a couple of things that are pretty tied together. So first one being the pay to play model in American club sports. Um, this is certainly a contentious issue, but in general, and it's, it's uh, I think more drastic in some parts of the country than, than others. Um, but the model is set up that uh, kind of the, the better athletes, the better coaches are accumulated in, in club sports. And um, to, to access those resources, you have to pay to be part of the club and to um, participate. Uh, this um, obviously limits who can participate and has become uh, more popular uh, across the country, especially as um, families see sports and sports scholarships as a way to get their, their children through college. So um, this, you know, families are more willing to pay to, for their child to be part of a club sport um, if they see it also as like, this is how I can help my, my child get to college and get through college. Um, and then another aspect that uh, prevents access to sports is, um, that school districts that are often uh, where kids uh, start playing sports, certainly where I started playing sports. Um, so school district funding can limit sports funding um, for that area. Uh, and to just walk through some specific uh, in historical patterns in one area, um, we can see how this limits sports access. So, um, my focus here is looking at um, an urban area. Uh, so because of historic structural racism in housing and lending policies, uh, also known as redlining, um, in many urban communities, few residents own their own houses. That's because they're, they're redlined, so they cannot um, get loans to then own um, a house in this urban community. Um, and this uh, lower level of home ownership can lead to a lower to lower levels of familial wealth and then a lower tax base in that area. Um, these 
urban areas are primarily black due to federal structural barriers known as covenant laws that are in the Federal Housing Administration loans. Um, so these barriers, um, these, are, these are structural barriers that are specific to black people and preventing them from um, suburban home ownership. Uh, so to go over that again, it's uh, basically that suburban homes um, were specifically uh, not, um, there were covenant laws in suburban communities that restricted black people from buying homes in suburban areas and therefore they were unable to move out of an urban area. Um, and so to look specifically at Philadelphia, um, and this is from 2018, so years after these structural barriers were going on, um, we can see that the Philadelphia School District in 2018 spends 10,000 less per pupil than the neighboring suburban neighborhood, which does offer a public rowing team. Um, and with 10,000 less dollars to spend per, per pupil, it's very hard to offer a rowing team in your community. Um, so then rowing only became available as a public resource when a nonprofit PCR um, Philadelphia City Rowing began in 2010 in the urban district. Um, again, here we've really mostly been presenting uh, not over Zoom, but in person. And if you have questions as we're going through this, um, please go ahead and message Akio and we'd love to, to look at those questions as we go. And here we'll just keep in mind these covenant laws. We'll kind of touch on that again later. Um, so you can just keep those in the back of your mind. We'll have a little more concrete example later. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so we're continuing to look at the myth of uh, we play on an even playing field, color doesn't matter in sport. Um, but as, as we researched this topic, I found, um, uh, you know, kind of almost as expected, unfortunately, that there's racism on the field and also on the water for um, rowers. Uh, so one instance of racism on the field that we see um, quite a lot is through sports journalism. Um, sports journalism often carries colonial themes, linguistic tropes that were historically used to promote the self-interest of colonizers and, and teaches racial bias to Americans. So to put this a little more concretely, like announcers at a soccer game or at a football game can be using um, a lot of racial language to describe players. Um, and uh, we see these myths as, as very common in um, sports journalism and in announcers that are covering uh, really popular um, games and matches. So the first myth that um, a woman, her name's Lori Latrice Martin, she writes a, a great book um, called uh, White Sports and Black Sports. Um, and she talks about uh, a few different myths about black athletes, the first one being that black athletes are naturally talented. Um, I think, you know, the more, the more I coach in a sport and the more, um, you know, I participate, participated in sports, you can see that uh, to get to a high level in sports, especially to a level that a, uh, you know, an NFL player has to get to or an NBA player has to get to, it takes a lot of time takes a lot of effort and work. And if we use the stereotype of um, a black athlete is naturally talented, we're discounting this work. Um, and we're, Lori Latrice Martin links this to actually discounting this work is really perpetuating the myth of the black athlete is lazy, which is a stereotype used throughout history to oppress um, black people. So I was like, a stereotype used to legitimize slavery, really. Um, 
And then the next myth that we see on black athletes um, are that they are dangerous or violent. Um, you see this um, in announcing. Um, and I have a little clip here uh, that's from the 2018 uh, Super Bowl, uh, which the Eagles did very well in. Um, but you can just see that this, this language is alive and happening today. Uh, so I'll play this clip really quick. Uh, I don't think we're getting audio on this end. Oh, okay. I was just going to ask that. My headphones, and I think. Yeah, yeah. Let me try again. Able to play that one more time. Yeah, the the audio is the part to look for. So let me play this again. Did you guys hear that? Okay. Yeah. So. Um, okay. So kind of, kind of hard to listen to, um, but basically the player that the, the one player that has dreads, uh, one of the black athletes on the um, Eagles team um, is called um, violent. And this happens like a few times in the game. So that was just one um, example of it. Um, I think you know, especially as a coach, uh, it's, it's really been important for me and I think important for coaches to really think about these two myths and, and bias that, might, that we might have been taught um, and, and how does that affect um, our work. Um, so, and then another aspect that uh, is researched on looking at racism on the field is um, looking at the quarterback position in the NFL. Um, the, the quarterback position in the NFL is like thought of as a, as a thinking position. Um, and then we see um, throughout history in the NFL that very few players are, um, black players are put in and played in the NFL as a quarterback. So this process is called stacking um, by race. And it's like the preconceptions we have about black people affect where a coach might play a player. So most black players are funneled to be like linebackers in the NFL. And then um, the quarterback position is more thought of as like a white position. Um, one cool thing that the uh, website undefeated was broadcasting this past year was calling this year um, the year of the black quarterback um, because we're seeing a lot more um, quarterbacks that are black um, you know before things really uh, started getting shut down due to COVID um, but that's cool and um, exciting to see and then one more aspect of of looking at racism on the field, um, and this this is thinking more about collegiate sports. Um, so, uh, the the way sports are tend to be divided in college, um, where we have certain collegiate sports that are profit making for the athletic department, and certain collegiate sports that um, really the athletic department just spends money on, um, and the way athletes. Um, right currently um, for the most part are divided in these these sides is that um, the more diverse sports are like basketball and football um, are the sports that are, are making money for the athletic department and then the less diverse sports um, like like rowing for me or Nordic skiing um, are are sports that the uh, athletic department is is just spending money on so um, as how that might affect an athlete, I think about that and I think about my um, collegiate rowing experience and um, in both rowing and skiing, it was said to me multiple times that like 
your uh, first priority is your academics and your health. Um, and you're doing this really for those reasons, like to balance your academics and to balance your health. Um, and I wonder if they would have, um, you know, an athlete would be given the same priority on health and academics in a, a for-profit sport. And um, we can see that that often is not as likely if um, kind of the success of the athletic department depends on the profit of a game um, and uh, making money off of that sport. So uh, that's an interesting collegiate level aspect and way to think about um, uh, racism on the field. So going on to our, our next slide here. Um, we move on to myth number three. Um, so as we think about race and sport, I think uh, one myth that might come to mind is that, oh, well, rowing has just kind of naturally become a, a more white sport, a predominantly white sport. Um, and so looking at the history of rowing, we can see if we find any clues that might, uh, you know, um, might counter this myth. Um, so I think we have a lot of skiers on our Zoom, so I won't make this too long, but um, in the history of rowing, uh, we see a lot of examples of exclusion and kind of an elite aura about the sport. Um, so rowing really started as we know it in the early 1700s in England. Um, and it's, it was mainly like the most popular uh, clubs and the, the areas where it was done the most was um, in, as amateur status sports. Um, so this status and um, uh, this, you know, if you were an amateur rowing club, that meant that you were excluding anyone who was working class or a laborer because um, it was thought that, you know, someone who worked outside all day or worked with their hands would have an advantage over uh, the uh, kind of like upper class people that were that were taking part in the sport. Um, and it was thought of, you know, if you let in kind of a working class um, athletes that you would not be preserving the quality of the, of the game was the language that was used. Um, so it was really only allowed as a ledger, as a, like a, le a leisure sport, excuse me. Um, and while there were documented smaller working class groups that would row for money, like to, with, with betting, um, this was not, this was like a very small group. And um, they were, this small group was often thought of as like prone to cheating because of the addition of money in the sport. Um, so, but this class segregation was really started to be contested in the 1920s. Um, J.B. Kelly was a bricklayer and rower in Philadelphia. Um, and he um, was rejected from rowing at some of the high, uh, the high competition, the, um, the, Royal Henley Regatta, which was thought of as kind of the most prestigious race at the time. He was rejected from that regatta in 1920. Um, but, you know, with his perseverance, he actually raced the winner of the Henley uh, singles race at the Olympics and beat them. And then his son applied to Henley later on and um, in 1947, uh, his son won the Diamond Skulls competition, was, which was the singles competition at the Henley Regatta. Um, another example of that is the book, The Boys in the Boat, which focuses on the 1936 um, Olympic team, which was really a group um, from out west and uh, was primarily sons of lumberjacks that eventually did very well beat 
some East Coast teams and went on to win the Olympics. Um, so if we contrast this history of rowing with other sports um, that are more diverse today, we can see that um, in the pre-1950s, uh, segregated black leagues were supporting the development of elite black athletes. So you, you had black leagues like uh, um, at the black YMCA um, that, you know, it was black because this was uh, during segregation. And in that community, they were developing some very high level um, black athletes. So um, contrasted to rowing, there were not um, kind of segregated black leagues documented in rowing. And, you know, maybe this is due to cost of boats. Maybe this is due to um, lack of access to water. Um, but uh, more research would need to be done to kind of find out what the barrier was. Um, and so, okay, so moving on to our next uh, myth. Um, as a Vermonter, I think, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I necessarily heard this myth a ton, but definitely kind of did not think about, you know, why is our state such a white state um, for a while? And I, I kind of wish I had that more in my earlier education. Um, but you can kind of, you know, if you're not looking for it, you can think, oh, Vermont is white because it's just naturally become a very white state. Um, and if, so if we look historically at levels of diversity Vermont, in Vermont um, and also in other rural area, areas, this can inform us when we're looking um, at diversity in sports too, especially with skiing, um, as um, all of you guys know, to like begin Nordic skiing, you need to be in a place where there are trails and there is snow. Um, so these, uh, Vermont is a naturally, is naturally a very white state. Through looking at this myth, we can also look at um, history of Nordic skiing. Okay, so I think, I hope I didn't skip a slide. No, okay. Yeah, and um, I'll just. Yeah, go ahead. Again, um, so we're going to be on the next couple slides here. We're going to be looking at this period that we um, kind of settled on as being a pretty important. This period of the Great Migration. This is in response to um, largely Jim Crow laws of the South, um, lynchings and threats of violence, and there was a large migration of Black individuals out of um, the South and into the rest of the country, largely the Midwest um, and the West, but also, also New England. Um, this period is roughly defined 1916 to 1970, as you see on the slide here. Um, so we'll be looking at these and keeping those dates in mind as we talk about a few of these policies um, that were enacted during this period. Some potentially in response to the Great Migration um, and some causality could be argued here, but regardless, the, the, whether it's coincidence or causal that these two things um, happen at the same time, or these multiple things are happening at the same time, it still um, is very important in the development of sport and also the development of the, the demographics of states like Vermont. Yeah, so um, one uh, one aspect that um, was actually recently researched even more by an Abenaki Vermonter um, was looking at uh, eugenics in Vermont. Um, eugenics was a uh, kind of a, a, a period, of, a very scary period in um, history and, and it was kind of a theme um, throughout the United States um, and, of course, the, the world, Europe. Um, 
but it was basically uh, eugenics looks at trying to um, preserve the Anglo-Saxon race. Um, and that's, that's how it was phrased in the eugenics um, survey that, that UVM um, did in Vermont. Um, so again, it's, it's um, eugenics is trying, the, the theme of eugenics is to preserve um, certain races and to do that by sterilizing other races. Um, uh, and this is, you know, hard to talk about, hard to, hard to look at in your own home state. Um, but uh, some really great research has been done on this topic. Um, so UVM um, put out the, what's called the Vermont Eugenics Survey. Um, in 1925 to 1936. And this survey uh, was performed kind of throughout Vermont and was looking um, for certain aspects in the population um, that they would then target for uh, possible sterilization. So uh, as I said, just recently, a woman named Judy Dow is, she's an Abenaki Vermonter. She just completed a fellowship on the Vermont Eugenics Survey. So she really was uh, studying this survey and how it was um, done in Vermont. Um, so the Vermont Eugenics Survey was really looking for what they called the three Ds. Um, and these, these are the terms they used that they would look for in the population. They were looking for delinquency, dependency, and mental defect. Um, and what what was targeted, like the races that were targeted and the people that were targeted um, through this language um, was in actuality um, what they called gypsy, which was um, dark-skinned people due to Abenaki, African-American or French Canadian um, heritage. Um, and then Korea, which was folks that had supposed Huntington's Korea illness. Um, and then also the looking for pirates. Um, so this was French Canadians on houseboats um, on Lake Champlain. Um, so, you know, once these uh, people that supposedly had the three Ds were targeted um, there, this was like the excuse that they needed to either be moved to a, like a home, uh, um, so like, I know I grew up in, so in Southern Vermont. So the, the place I think of is the Brattleboro Retreat, which um, in studying Judy Dow's work, she brings up the Brattleboro Retreat as one of the kind of places that they would put both children of those targeted by the, by the survey as well as adults. Um, and then uh, she talks about as an Abenaki, Vermonter people in her family that would go in for like an appendix uh, surgery and and then like were unable to have children after that surgery. Um, so it's just a, a pretty sad dark part of Vermont history um, and a time when they're really using the language of the three D's to um, really promote social control at a time when maybe it was thought that migration was a threat and um, they used these, this language to um, almost as like a, an excuse for sterilizing people that were not Anglo-Saxon. Um, so the image we have here is from the Burlington Free Press. Um, and you know, you can see the kind of language that was used at the time. Um, this is from 1926 and says heredity is a big problem. Home for feeble-minded feeble is filled with those whose parents were not as carefully selected as dairymen breed cattle. Um, pretty scary terms to see. And uh, this, this uh, theme of eugenics could definitely be thought of as um, a reason that if you were not white, if you were not Anglo-Saxon, it might be less, um, uh, advisable or tempting to move to Vermont during the Great Migration. Just to be just to be fair, also that is not 
the eugenics movement was not solely in Vermont. There are several other parts of the country had strong eugenics movements as well as in other nations. But that is something that yeah. was present during this period, 1925 to 1936 in Vermont uh, and is an important thing to consider. Yes. So again, looking at policies during this period of the Great Migration, um, a few other things were also going on at the same time. So sundown towns are an interesting thing that I came across that I didn't know about before. Um, but Dr. Lowen is a UVM professor who's made it his, this is his focus of research is on sundown towns. These are towns that um, are defined as towns that had either signs on the side, on the edge of town or written ordinances that prohibited black people and also sometimes Jewish families or Italian immigrant families or there are a few different um, foci for these ordinances, but it almost always included black people and then sometimes additionally, yeah, Jews or other groups. But they would have signs on the side of town saying, black people are not welcome in town after sunset um, or and they would not use those kind terms. Their um, the language was much more violent and offensive, but um, that was the idea. Or the ordinance would say, black people or people of yeah, Negro blood or a few different terms would not be allowed to buy homes in a certain city. Um, so these sundown towns, there's a map on the right with um, the seven, towns that he has identified as possible or probable sundown towns in Vermont. So here we have Swanton, Colchester, Waterbury, Morrisville, Tunbridge, Poulney, and Bellows Falls. So especially in the Craftsbury community, Morrisville being one of those as seen as a potential, or uh, I think it was viewed as a possible, he qualified it as possible sundown town. Um, is interesting. Um, and yeah, as Carol just added there for all you to see, uh, the Stowe Inn at one point had brochures only um, saying that only Gentiles, seems like the word she used, could stay. So yeah, similar idea. Oh wow. Um, and here I've also put in Minnesota, there are 20 um, potential possible or confirmed sundown towns. In Wisconsin, Lowen, Dr. Lowen has identified 236 towns. So um, we'll just keep that in mind as we um, continue through this presentation, but present in many states, very common or yeah, quite prevalent in the Midwest. And this is in that period, largely between 1920 and 1960, but some towns even had uh, these policies on the, these ordinances on the book through um, 1970 and there's some places today that still support these ideas um, with like publicly displayed signs um, that are pretty racist that business owners are not ashamed to fly and think it'll actually support their business to fly these signs in their towns and that's present day so Sundown Town is very important and um, not well known. Another thing in this, uh, another element in this time period that was important in the mid 1920s, there was a pretty rapid and uh, rise in participation in the KKK in New England, particularly uh, in Vermont and Maine. There were large rallies the largest rally, daytime rally in America of KKK members was in Maine, um, with some estimates of having up to 10,000 people there. And I believe that was in 19, I want to say 1924, mid 1920s. Um, similarly, there was a rally, a large rally in Montpelier that had some estimates say close to 5,000 people. Um, that I believe was 1927 or 28. Um, this was a short period when this was happening in Vermont, New England. By the, after 1928, we pretty much see 
these KKK movements dying out in New England. So it was short lived, but it's also a pretty important time. This is the beginning of the Great Migration. So as you're establishing these routes of migration from the South to Northern or Midwestern or Western cities, if you have policies like this that say, oh, these communities do not support or welcome Black people, then you're not going to have an establishment of the building of these pathways of people, Black people from the South to states like Vermont. Um, yes, so um, another aspect that we researched a bit and, and added for, especially for, um, you know, rural areas that are primarily agricultural, like Vermont, um, there's uh, definitely been, um, you know, documented racism in the USDA, so the U.S. Department of Agricultural Lending Policies, um, and the USDA is the main um, place where a farmer would get a loan for their land, um, and uh, so there's been a documented decline in African-American farmers since uh, the reconstruction period. Um, and this can be tied to racism in lending policies. Um, so a class action lawsuit for discriminatory lending practices against the, the federal government was settled in 1999, um, but there are still documented inequitable lending issues occurring uh, practically today. There was a recent reveal episode on NPR that uh, kind of uh, showed one of these cases. And I believe, Akio, correct me I, if I'm wrong, but I believe this was from the 90s or 20, 2010s. Do you remember, Akio, the date? Yeah, I think, I think that this individual that the reveal episode was looking at was forcibly removed from his property in 2012 but he had been farming his land since I believe the, yeah, the nineties. Um, and yeah, basically it was shown that it was, there is a lawsuit pending or like ongoing in regard to this individual, but mm -hmm. um, the lawsuits over um, discriminatory lending practices for this individual during that time, which did result in their losing their farm. Yeah. yeah. So we could see, we can, um, really see these uh, as kind of adding up as barriers to uh, uh, moving to rural areas uh, during the Great Migration. That particular episode looked at a farm in North Carolina, to be um, clear. Yeah. But yep. these policies obviously were quite prevalent um, earlier in the 1900s. Um, but still seeing some isolated incidents, even, yeah, basically today. Okay, so moving on to our next slide. This is um, a graphic relating to what we touched on earlier, the idea of uh, racial covenants. So these are written into the deed for a house that explicitly says this house may not be sold to a person of, at that turn, time, they'd say maybe Negro descent or Negro blood or something like that. So a black individual. Um, and so this is a picture in, uh, from 1954. And this graphic comes from the website Mapping Prejudice, which is a project from the University of Minnesota that has done really interesting work in starting pre predominantly in the Minneapolis area, looking at the growth of these racial covenants. So the first racial covenants, I believe, were popping up in the early yeah, 19 teens um, or around 1920. And you see a few of them, and then they have a time lapse, which I recommend going to their website, mappingprejudice.org. Really interesting to watch it quickly. and. This shows 1954, all of those blue areas, those are houses that have racial covenants built into them. So black people were not allowed to buy houses um, in any of these blue houses. And you can see the total on that graph. If you can see that it's 22,000, just over 22,000 houses. Um, so affecting 22,000 families 
And there also were um, covenants that prohibited Jews from buying homes and potentially other ethnic groups. So um, this is yeah one of the residential segregation tactics used um, by real estate developers to create uh, this kind of shadow apartheid system in the US. And keep in mind, this is Minneapolis, which is obviously a hotbed of um, racial tensions right now and something we'll talk about more. Mm -hmm. um, so one more um, aspect to think about, like how, how did rural areas um, become more white in our country? Um, if we go back even earlier um, to 1862, um, that is the, the time of the Homestead Act. Um, and this was, um, you know, a, a way that land really moved primarily into the hands of white people. Um, so the Homestead Act was signed in 1862. And what it said was that you could get 40 to 160, sorry, that's acres of land for free if you farmed it for five years. Um, so, you know, this was uh, when started, people started really moving west and, and people were um, kind of making homes for themselves on uh, different plots of land across America. And then if they farmed it for five years, that could become their land. And land, um, as we talked about earlier, um, really becomes, is, is a pathway to gaining familial wealth. Um, so in 1862, at that time, black people in America were still enslaved. So the Civil War um, went from about 1861 to 1865. So really the first shot at the, the Homestead Act, um, you had to be an American, city, American citizen to take part in the Homestead Act. Um, so, uh, black people, when they were enslaved, were not considered American citizens and could not take part in this Homestead Act, at least for the first few years of it. Um, so, um, Akio, if you want to jump in a bit on the yeah. exodusters, yeah. Um, so, in this period, one um, noteworthy uh, episode is uh, people talk about this, um, they use the term exodusters, which was a group of people um, led uh, um, yeah, by an individual, I believe his name is Stapleton, who in 1979, or largely between 77 and 79, led approximately 20,000 black individuals from um, the South, Tennessee, um, some from uh, Mississippi and other southern states into Kansas to take advantage of the Homestead Act. Um, and this was one of the largest black movements out of the south into rural, like one of the largest organized um, movements of black individuals out of the south into the homesteading act areas. Um, so there definitely were some Black individuals that took advantage of this, but um, even for some of those individuals, they did face later some discrimination in keeping their farms when they needed loans and things to, you know, either make their farm bigger or buy things to like, animals and machine machinery and stuff. So this, the Homestead Act was not. It's not that no black people took advantage of it. Some definitely tried and some successfully did. For certain black families, it was an escape from the South and from urban and suburban segregation policies. But proportionally, um, the Homestead Act was far more influential and uh, helpful in generating familiar wealth for white individuals. Mm -hmm. And 
also it's obviously quite important to realize that this <laughs> the entire homestead act was a means for the u.s to get the settlers that are maybe mainly on the east coast or in the eastern half of the country into the west which means they're just dispossessing the native american people um, and so we see the wars against the indian native americans and um, the creation of native american reservations in this time period in response to the homestead act so those kind of went hand in hand so when we're talking about native individuals that are also discriminated discriminated against uh, that's quite important to note and keep in mind that all of this stealing of land from native americans giving mainly to white individuals and some black individuals but all at the cost of native people yeah um and while our presentation doesn't quite focus on that topic you know it kind of underlays a lot of um, history in America. Um, this uh, image though, before we go to the next slide, um, is was really interesting to me um, in that it, it kind of shows where the Homestead Act was really taking place. Um, so you can see it starts in 1868 because, uh, so these were entries and that, you know, the Homestead Act was signed in, in 1862. So by the time you got to 1868, people had, um, were more likely to have farmed the land for five years and then they could be, have an entry um, as a homestead. Um, and you could see, uh, you know, certain states um, have more entries than others, like Colorado, like Montana, um, Kansas is pretty high, North Dakota. Um, so that's an interesting graphic to look at when looking at the homestead. Um, when we think act. about those, many of those states are now quite white states, mm -hmm. um, some of which have strong ski centers. So important things to keep in mind, these connections. Yeah. Um, most people on this call or watching this likely know a lot about the history of skiing, but I'll just give a very brief overview and make a few connections here. So. Obviously, uh, the, well, maybe not obvious for everyone, but skiing largely um, originated in Scandinavia and Russia. First advertised race was in Norway in 1843. Um, in the US, the National Ski Association of America was founded in 1905. And we see two years later in 1907, there were 27 clubs participating or as a part of the National Ski Association of America and all but one of those were located in the Midwest. So this is a region that had a lot of Scandinavian um, immigrants at this time period, as well as German and a few other, uh, but predominantly white immigrants. And so if we look at this time period again, also this is 1907, so this is just before the beginning of the Great Migration. We can then make connections to, as we we're talking about the sundown towns, for instance, Edina um, was renowned as a, a strong sundown town that prohibited black individuals from being in town and buying homes, um, Jews and blacks. And their policies proclaiming the Sundown Town official town ordinance um, was maintained as a town ordinance through 1970. Um, so that's pretty recent. And still today, I mean, we see that Edina is a Nordic ski or cross country ski center in the Twin Cities area. And they have a strong high school program. And it's also a pretty affluent suburb that is predominantly white. So these connections of the majority of the ski clubs in America forming in the Midwest and the Midwest being having a lot of white and um, demographically being predominantly white with a lot of 
policies that support and maintain that system during this development period. Um, it was pretty important. Another interesting idea looking at skiing and talking about language. Here we have the NENSA logo, which when I was speaking with some NENSA individuals, they brought to light this idea um, of the, the, the words we're using, the verbiage of Nordic Ski Association, New England Nordic Ski Association, and the idea of this language, the term Nordic applying to the Nordic nations, um, which are yeah, Scandinavian, Scandinavian nations. Stereotypically, it evokes an image of blonde hair, blue eyes, white skin. Um, so embedded in the language that we use, and I, I think like many, use the terms cross country and Nordic interchangeably, but embedded in those terms are exclusionary words that can be unwelcoming or could be unwelcoming to individuals that don't um, associate with the idea of Nordic um, or think it's, yeah, doesn't include their people that look like them when I think of that term. Um, and this is not a shot at Nensa. Um, I think it's just an interesting way to be, to look at how some of these terms are so embedded in our daily practice and speech. Um, and yeah, another idea for this idea of like elitism in Nordic skiing. Some people also view Nordic skiing as being kind of more elite and like racing. And then some people think of cross country skiing as more kind of you go and ski in your backyard for fun. You walk around in the woods. That's cross country skiing and Nordic skiing is kind of racing and more elite. And so then again, you have a tying of this idea of like elite skiing being with the idea of Nordic and Nordic nations and white individuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so moving on to our next slide. Um, that was kind of wrapping up the myth of, you know, Ver Vermont is naturally, naturally a white state um, and thinking about how that plays um, into um, how skiing might become a naturally white sport. Um, so, uh, and also informing, you know, um, how those areas became more white. Um, so the next uh, and last myth we're going to look at, myth number five, um, looking at it is better to let people naturally choose what sport they want to do. Um, as a coach that's, you know, interested, uh, as many are right now, in making their or trying to create um, more space in their sport for more diversity. Um, you know, it, you can get tied up by this uh, myth being like, well, who am I to choose what sport someone should do? Um, but um, as this presentation and the research Akio and I have been working on and other conversations, you just see that there's so many barriers to access to um, the sports uh, of skiing and rowing um, that we're going to miss out on a lot of um, athletes and we don't, people won't be given the option really if we aren't taking thoughtful steps toward inclusivity. Um, so you're looking at the research around the promise of inclusion in sports. Um, there's a lot of information here. Um, I wanted to start with a quote from Arshay Cooper. Um, he is the man behind a movie that just came out called um, A Most Beautiful Thing. And this was a, a movie about a, a black rowing coach and a black rowing team. Um, and I highly recommend it. Um, but Arshay Cooper says he was given an award, an award at the US Rowing um, Conference. And he um, said this in his award speech. He said, the history of sports tells us that each sport has made a significant impact in the world in some way, but none has entirely reached this goal without the power of diversity. Um, and as we go to other research, researchers, we see that um, inclusivity is 
thought of as successful in sport and diverse sports have the opportunity to not only promote success and, and winning in that sport, but to promote health, academics, and interracial understanding, um, as well as debunk racial stereotypes. Um, so um, an example that I thought was interesting to look at was uh, research by the Aspen Institute, which was where that first um, uh, chart was from. Um, Anyway, that they provided some research on Norway. Um, so in 1988, um, in Norway, the, they went to the Olympics that winter and um, they didn't do very well. And so um, the, it was reported that Norway saw this as a national trauma, which I think is kind of a funny phrasing of it, but um, they, were very purposeful in how they took steps forward after having that um, kind of loss, as they would call it. Um, so they researched, okay, how do we how do we create Olympians and how do we create more Olympians? Um, and that from this research, they they decided to put all of their funding into youth programs in their country, so that uh, every a uh, Norwegian kid could um, play sports, could access uh, a lot of different sports, could try a lot of different sports. Um, and um, they, they um, made sure that kids weren't becoming too competitive too early so that they were kind of including kids that were not as quick to develop into a sport um, and would develop later on, perhaps as an Olympic athlete, um, so they're very, very purposeful with being inclusive and strategic with their um, youth programs. Um, and then you can see, you know, in 2018, when there's been enough time for this program to really take place and the, and the children to grow into athletes, um, you see that uh, Norway won 39 medals um, at the Olympics in 2018. And this is the highest medal count of any country uh, at the Winter Olympics, and also an incredible ratio of of medals to their country population. Um, so Norway is definitely a different country than the United States uh, in a lot of ways, uh, but it is really interesting, and I think we can still learn from aspects of their uh, research and their uh, then putting research into practice with their um, Olympic programs. No, uh, as yeah, we just yeah. said, Norway is racially not um, particularly diverse. It's a pretty white country. And so in that sense, this doesn't really talk about the success of, you know, black performance in some of these sports, but the model and the idea of uh, investing in the base and in development as a system to creating successful individuals is still um, interesting and applicable. Totally, totally. Um, and then, and then moving on to looking at tennis, which um, you know, when we were looking at the slide on uh, the percentage of first generation athletes in college um, of college athletes. So how many, what percent of college athletes are first generation college athletes? Um, we saw that tennis, women's tennis was one that actually increased the percentage of first generation athletes um, in uh, collegiate tennis. So uh, I found tennis um, and the US Tennis Association um, as really interesting to look at. Um, I think a lot of us can, can think back to what we've seen of tennis and, and know that there have been some really star uh, black athletes in tennis. And these black athletes have really pushed their governing body um, to create more um, like diversity and inclusion me measures within their sport. So the governing body uh, now requires diversity in hiring um, and in suppliers uh, for 
tennis uh, matches and organizations. Um, and also they have created grants and uh, for uh, black athletes. And they also on their website, they have engagement guides for like how to engage more um, diversity at your rowing club. Um, how do you, how do you um, incorporate and make your club more in inclusive? Um, so this is really interesting, especially, you know, I think it was definitely be because of the hard work of some star black athletes, but shows that them pushing, the, pushing a governing body um, can really create some changes um, in their sport. Um, and then uh, for last point here, kind of a funny one, but um, these guys, Barney and Barney, uh, really relate the curse of the Boston Red Sox as to um, basically the when a manager that was pretty racist in in the players he brought in and in the hiring at the Boston Red Sox left and then so in 2004 their team had was like a more diverse team they had um, like uh David Ortiz, Pedro Martinez, and Manny Ramirez on the team. And of course, this is when they broke the curse and, and won the World Series. So they uh, very much relate breaking the curse to um, the team becoming more inclusive and, and a more uh, diverse athlete pool. Okay, and then going on to our next slide, another um, another aspect of, of having more diversity in sports and in, in creating more inclusivity in, in sports is that uh, many athletes ha use sports as platforms for social justice. So they've really um, worked hard and become leaders in their sport. And then they use this platform to also advocate for social justice. Um, and this is really prevalent everywhere. These are just a few examples um, on the on the left here, um, Muhammad Ali, so an advocate for social justice, and also uh, he was very much against the Vietnam War and was very vocal about that. Um, in the middle, uh, this is an image from the 1968 Olympics, and this was uh, a protest from some track athletes, American track athletes. Um, they called this a human rights salute that they were doing during the American um, anthem. And they also, you can't really see it in this picture, but they were not wearing shoes and they were wearing black socks to represent black poverty, which they were protesting. Um, and then on the right, of course, is Colin Kaepernick. Um, so here he's taking a knee here to protest against police brutality, um, you know, which he's been doing for a long time. And uh, just to close here, this is our last slide. Um, when we're looking at black athletes that have, um, you know, pr predominant and successful black athletes, there's two that uh, jump out in rowing. Um, these are two black rowing Olympians that have both written, written books. Um, and so I just wanted to pull a couple of quotes from them as uh, both these books are, are, are great reads. Um, the first quote is from Anita de France. Uh, she writes, I took to rowing immediately. I may not have been perfect for rowing, but it was perfect for me. I loved the outdoors and rowing for me was about being outdoors and in nature. In addition to being part of a team, I liked the fact that the sport didn't cause any harm to its competitors or to the environment. Um, I think it's important to hear from these black Olympians like what they, what brought them to the sport and what really kept them in the sport. Um, Akil Abdullah writes, cultural issues slipped from my mind when I discovered with amazement the power and balance required to move a boat gracefully across the water, 
rowing in the Washington spring air and around the beautiful landscape of the Potomac River affected me far beyond any issues of race. I had found a new love, a love for a sport segregated not by law, not by intention, but by the preconceptions people had about the sport. I was hooked immediately. Um, so that's kind of where we're finishing up our presentation. Um, and, you know, we, we're coming, you know, it's been going on for quite a while, but uh, we'd love to hear any questions from, from you guys. I'm going to stop screen sharing for the moment. I'm trying to find out. Uh, hold on. And um, I don't know, Akio, I think because we don't have a ton of people on, it's totally fine if you want to just um, ask a question by unmuting uh, yourself as well. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. And if you want to shout out a question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask yeah. away. I wrote this in the chat. Thank you both Akio and Nicole. That was a really, really good presentation and good historical research that I never learned in, a, in school. Um, mm. Yeah. Um, but tell, tell me the name of the movie you recommended again. It, it had beautiful in the title. Yeah, um, it's called A Most Beautiful Thing. Okay. Um, and it actually is just coming out this like end of summer oh it's not out yet it's it's being uh played at like various college campuses which is cool okay. um but it's it's not like officially you know you can't find it on netflix yet oh okay yeah but hopefully soon and y you know if you go to their website on the movie um i'm sure there's there's more info on how to find it soon too yeah the most beautiful thing it's yeah it was that that was a crew out of Chicago, which is um, an interesting city for race relations in our country. Yeah. It's supposed to be good. And, and Arshe Cooper is um, a real, like, we were very lucky to have him in the rowing community. Um, he's uh, been advocating for, uh, you know, the, he's been talking to various like to Craftsbury and to um, other rowing communities on how we can improve. So that's been like an, a really uh, awesome thing that came from this movie as well. I hope people tune into your recording. Oh yeah, I think they will. Yeah, we're glad to have it recorded so now people at at their own time and leisure can access it. Yeah. But gl glad to have you, Carol. Good to see to yeah, see your I, picture I, a bit here. Yeah. Um, interested that you're now at Craftsbury. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The the high schools will miss you. Well, I'm still trying to balance everything, but um, yes, we will we will hopefully be moving forward with everything. We'll see. I'll, I'll be in touch for sure. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you guys for coming. Um, and you, you can, uh, you know, great to have some questions. Um, and we will post this video um, both, I think, on the Craftsbury channel as well as Mensa, I believe. So, or just you can be in touch with us um, if you if you want to see the recording or or pass it along. Okay. Uh, thanks for coming, everyone. Yeah. Thanks for coming. I'm gonna stop recording.